called this is called the King's Crusade, an attempt to go back and retake Jerusalem. So that's what's happening there. The movie, I felt as much time as they spent on Saladin, they sort of glossed over what was going on on the Muslim side of politics. They sort of portray them as one solid block. But as you were saying, there was Seljuk Turks that nobody was particularly happy with the way they were dealing in Jerusalem. What was the relationship between Saladin, who was not a Turk himself, and the Seljuk Turks and some of the other factions within the Muslim community in the Holy Land at that point? Yeah, good question. Um, Saladin is from Tikrit, the same city as Saddam Hussein. Ethnically, he is Kurdish. So Kurdish nationalists today celebrate Saladin as their hero. Back at that time, your ethnic identity wouldn't matter as much. The nature of an empire is you have people from different cultures, different backgrounds coming together because you have to, not because of tolerance. And this is a point in the movie where um, Orlando Bloom's father, played by Liam Neeson, he's celebrated as this tolerant person who embraces all religions. And when Saladin retakes Jerusalem, spoiler alert, I guess, 1000 year old spoiler alert, he looks at a crucifix, he places it upright, he kind of has this look of benevolence and tolerance about him as he goes about the city. And this is something everyone gets wrong about empires. When people look at the past, they imagine that, oh, if I were a Christian or a Muslim, I would support my brethren and then try to kill the other religion. (gasps) Wait, look at the Mongols. They allowed other religions to live. (gasps) Look at Saladin. He allowed Christians to live. (gasps) Look at this Christian leader. He allowed Muslim safe passage. And I think, what else would they have done? I mean, empires were always hard to hold together. And it was almost always pragmatism that you simply had to allow these other religious groups to exist because your state would fall apart otherwise. And it wasn't in your interest to control the other the beliefs of your people. And you didn't have the resources when everything is done on horseback, when you don't have modern communication, when you don't have public schools to influence what people think as they're being taught. There's no way to influence the thoughts and beliefs on other people. So there's all these theses like the Mongols were tolerant because they allowed religions to coexist, but there simply was no other way to operate. And in fact, periods in history where you're trying to force beliefs on another person stand out because in some ways they're so exceptional. So for example, the Spanish Inquisition in 1492 It was a horrific event, of course. I mean, it's horrific that people were forced sort of at the, you know, burning at the stake to renounce their beliefs or to be expelled. That ignores that for 700 years, the Muslim states there in Spain were fighting a war of attrition. Spanish rulers are taking over the Iberian Peninsula piece by piece. There are many Muslim subjects under Christian rule, and there are laws where they have a place carved out for them, not so much due to Spanish benevolence, but because there was no practical way to force someone to change their religion. And you figure, well, the best I can do is tax them and then live and let live. And that's what, since really the beginning of Islam, how they dealt with Christian and Jewish subjects, tax them and then live and let live because we do not have the manpower and resources to do otherwise. And so anyway, on the Muslim side, that's a factor. And I'll I'll mention one other thing too. This really astounded me because my research focus was on Turkish intellectuals in the 1800s and their engagement with the West and modern modernity. The Muslim world until may, until only in the last hundred years did not care about the Crusades. If you were a scholar, you wouldn't know that the Crusades ever happened. The first book in Arabic, I think is like 1899 about the Crusades. And it only becomes a big deal in the Muslim world because of colonialism. Europeans are talking about colonialism and taking over parts of the Middle East like, oh, we are the crusaders and we have returned. And then Arab intellectuals in the 1900s sort of respond in kind that we will take up the cause of Saladin and kick you out as he did before. But throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the 1500s into the 1800s, um, there's no knowledge of the Crusades because why would you care? These This tiny, tiny, tiny little kingdom was held for a couple of hundred years. Then the Europeans lose and then they go home. I mean, what really stuck out were the Mongol invasions. The Mongols kill 40 million people. They destroy Baghdad. 
so fundamentally re-alter the map of the Middle East that that is the most cataclysmic event there. You wouldn't care about the Crusades. And the earliest writings of the Crusades I've seen in the 1800s in Turkish are translations from French. And they the Enlightenment kind of snubbing of the Middle Ages, they're taking this Enlightenment rhetoric from France and using it against the Crusades. So the idea that this is the linchpin that's permanently altered Christian-Muslim relations, it's you, it's really an argument about colonialism today. And the Crusades are just used as a stand-in, but no one cared about the Crusades until recent period in the past. And when Kaiser Wilhelm goes to Damascus, Syria, I think it's 1899, he's traveling in the Middle East after he sacks Otto von Bismarck. He wants to um, increase German presence in the Middle East, so he goes on a tour of goodwill. He asks people where the tomb of Saladin is. And Saladin is a beloved figure in Europe at this time. He's a legendary figure in, you know, the stories of the Crusades is this noble, worthy opponent of Richard the Lionheart. He asks people where the tomb is and nobody knows. Finally, he finds the tomb. It's in complete ruin and he pays money to have the tomb rebuilt. And then he lays a wreath at the tomb that says from one great leader to another. So Saladin, the great hero, the great reconquer of Jerusalem, was forgotten only in, until recent history in the Muslim world. And it's interesting you bring up that recent history. Recent history has also sort of refocused what the Crusades are, and that's the war on terror and the actions that have been happening in the Middle East lately, probably with, uh, you could probably say, maybe the last several decades. How has that changed how people look at the Crusades? Yeah, there's been some pretty ridiculous books. One that came out is called The Case for the Crusades by Rodney Stark. He's not a historian. He's, a, I think, a sociologist, so red flag right there. The Post 9-11, it's kind of it's a response against the colonialist theory. And I mentioned that the, the point of the Crusades wasn't colonization. That's kind of a post-World War II, you know, criticism. But then the response back to that is that, no, 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 it was actually good. The Crusaders weren't they were fighting a defensive war, not an offensive war, because they'd been under attack by Islam since the rise of Islam in the 600s and 700s and Northern Africa has taken over. Spain has taken over. There's fears in Europe that the Muslim world is going to envelop Christendom. So it's a war to strike against the heart of Islam. Now, that's equally ridiculous in its own way as this post 9-11 revisionist history and the idea of the war on terror, because the Muslim world stops expanding after the Battle of Tours in 732 in France. Uh, the Abbasids do conquer Sicily in the 8th century, but there's really no expansion at that point. Uh, the Crusaders themselves don't talk about the fear of Europe being overrun by Islam. There's no mention uh, of this idea anywhere. And again, if you're worried about the Islamic world, why not go to Spain instead of going all the way to the Holy Land, where it's much more difficult uh, to fight at that level? So it's another kind of projection into the past. It's sort of like saying that well, why did the invasion of Normandy happen? It's revenge from, uh, I don't know, against William the Conqueror, who went from Norman France to England. So England is taking revenge. Like, those two things have nothing to do with each other. They're spread apart by centuries and centuries and centuries. And the idea that there's this institutional memory in Europe, we remember when you attack Spain in the 700s. So we're fighting back. And that's not something that would and if you're going to fight back against the Muslim world, why would you go to Jerusalem? The spiritual center of Islam is Mecca and Medina, of course. The intellectual center is Baghdad. The political center, I guess, would be Egypt. But Jerusalem, of course, it's an important city in Islam, but it's maybe the third most important. It's not it's not the top dog the way it would be in Christendom. So. Islam versus Christendom, like whether you think Christianity is at fault or Islam is at fault, I think both perspectives miss the point. Now, it's interesting in the movie for an, uh, the director's cut, which was almost three and a half hours long. Yeah. They didn't go very deeply into any of the characters, really. I mean, a lot of the movie was just Alien played by Orlando Bloom looking at the female lead, and that was about it. But they, so they kind of skimmed over and they completely cut out the Greeks who, like you said, the Greeks were the ones who had called for the Pope 
to give them a little bit of help. And a lot of these leaders were married into the Byzantine royal family. What were the, how were they playing in things, especially at this point in the late 1100s? Well, in the First Crusade, it's called by the Byzantines. The Byzantines offer aid when the Crusaders stop in Constantinople before going south to Jerusalem. Originally, it's envisioned that there'd be some Western knights that would show up. They'd aid the Byzantine army. They'd liberate Antioch. They'd liberate Jerusalem. And then the Byzantines would administer Jerusalem. And they had 400 years before. And they had only lost Antioch about 20 years before. That was the original idea, but then turns into its own thing where the Western knights are operating on their own. And then the disastrous Fourth Crusade, when Constantinople is sacked by Western knights in 1204 and controlled by Latin crusaders for about 60 years, permanently leads to enmity between the two sides. So there's not the Byzantine military presence in the Holy Land, but there are a lot of Christians in Jerusalem I think about half the city or so might have been Christian uh, of the Orthodox variety or Nestorian variety in Jerusalem. And this is what leads to, I don't know if I'd say a hybrid culture, but intercultural mingling where you do have some Latin knights marrying uh, locals. And that's almost invariably uh, Orthodox Christians in that land. So this is something where it's not just like these outsider Europeans and turbaned Arabs, like the movie makes it seem to be. But there is this interesting hybrid culture as well that slowly starts to develop. Although the intermingling, um, as far as I understand in the Middle East, it's not like uh, Muslim on Spain, where there's very porous boundaries between Muslim and Christian and Jew, and they commonly speak uh, a similar language with one another and with no Arabic. There's Less of an intermingling because a lot of the Crusaders are in heavily garrisoned cities, uh, or if they are a baron who has some of their own land. That can happen, but there's a lot of people being in fortifications. It's kind of like with the early spread of Islam. Many of the soldiers live outside of the cities in heavily garrisoned forts. So that's why the Arab culture and Arab language is still maintained, and you don't see people soldiers there start to speak Coptic or Syriac or whatever. There's something sort of similar in the Crusades where because of garrison fortress defense, that doesn't lead to this maybe massive cross-pollinization like you would see. Although, of course, there are influences that the Crusades do have on Europe. Hey, everyone. Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. That's interesting you bring that up because at this point, there's a lot of those crusader leaders who were born in the Middle East. They've traveled back to Europe very infrequently and they did show the, um, the princess. Sibylla? Yeah. She was wearing henna all the time and dressed in a very, I guess you might say like, um, archetypal Middle Eastern fashion. Did fashions and that sort of thing, did the crusaders who were basically born in the Middle East, did they at least take on some of those aspects of the culture or did they stay more in line with European fashion and European modes of culture? Oh, well, this is a, an aside, and I, I think you might know more about this as a movie buff than me. But when I was taking notes on the movie and looking at Eva Green's character, as an aside, hands down, best Bond girl ever. Um, but... Um, <laughs> I thought to myself, is this during Ridley Scott's kind of like creative bankrupt period? Because I feel like he's kind of desperately trying to ape off of Lord of the Rings, where when the (laughs) knights are charging into combat, you hear this mournful Middle Eastern music. But then I hear things I think this sounds like the Elvish singing when the Knights of Rohan are charging into battle. (laughs) And Evergreen, is she trying to be Arwen, basically this, you know, really sort of porcelain like figure who's in the background and i wrote down if this movie were made in 2012 evergreen would have been a cheap knockoff of scarlett johansson's black widow and know all sorts of martial arts (laughs) and combat so i don't know if you're had any sense there of yeah now there is uh some impact on culture of europe at this time so some have um theorized that the use of rosary beads by catholics comes from the use of uh, prayer beads that Muslims would have in their hands to recount the names of God, uh, a possible Muslim influence, or that the hygienic practices of 
Muslims as they're doing ablutions before times of prayer could have influenced uh, hygiene standards. 